don't know about you, but man, I get happy when I think about the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, praise team, for leading us in worship this evening. And uh, if you will, turn me in your Bibles to Psalm 51, the 51st Psalm, Psalm of David. Well, I want to talk to us tonight for just a few minutes in this season of Thanksgiving about the greatest reason to give thanks. The greatest reason to give thanks. Psalms 51, verse 1 says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. I want to put our Bibles in our seats for just a moment. Let's lift our hands toward heaven and ask the Lord for his help tonight. God, we ask that you would anoint your word, that you open our hearts and minds to hear and receive from you. We give you thanks and glory for the power of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The greatest reason to give thanks. Now, if your Bible includes the superscript, which is the, in mine I have the Apostolic Study Bible, uh, the superscript is uh, the script under the text that identifies some things you need to know about the history of this text. This particular psalm is marked as a psalm of David to the chief musician when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. And you would think, Brother Brian, this is a weird text to pick for a Thanksgiving message. But bear with me for just a minute. As my mind began to think about all of the things we could be thankful for, I began to think I was reading an article recently that talked about reasons to be thankful. And it was talking about that North American, not just even United States, but Canada, and even some in Mexico, experience such great wealth that we actually, you and I sitting here tonight, are more wealthy than some of the great rulers and governors and kings and emperors that we think about from times past. I mean, you have state-of-the-art housing. I don't think anybody in here has a house that doesn't have indoor plumbing. Praise God. I'm not still using outhouses. We have HVAC. We have a refrigerator that keeps our food preserved and ready for us to cook. We even have services that will bring us food. Yes, we have to pay them, but they will bring food to us anytime we want it. Even the poorest person in America oftentimes is wealthier than anybody in a third world country. We have many great reasons to be thankful. But when I began to read this Psalm of David, I began to think about how humiliating that it must have been for David when Nathan came to him that night. No doubt David had hidden his secret for so long and so well that he had begun to think that he'd gotten away with his horrible atrocity. You know, I don't have to go into great detail how that David did not go to war when it was a time that kings went to battle. He chose to stay at home. Can I tell you, it is a good for a man to go out and work when he is supposed to be working. But David chose to sit at home. He chose to let his imagination run wild. And there he got caught up in the beauty of Bathsheba, committed adultery with her, tried to cover it by murdering her husband. A whole sordid affair. And by now, David is doing his best to forget the whole thing and put the past behind him. There is no doubt in my mind that David had no idea where Nathan the prophet was going when he launched into his story about the poor oppressed man who had one lamb. But he had someone come, a stranger come for dinner, and he wanted to feed this guest a great dinner. Or I'm sorry, his neighbor, the ruler who had lots of lambs, had someone come for dinner who he wanted to feed a great dinner. But rather than kill one of his many lambs, he took the poor man's one lamb and killed that poor man's one lamb to feed his guest. 
And when David heard this great atrocity, how that the ruler took the poor man's lamb, when he had many of his own, he said, oh, show me this man that I may punish him. And the prophet Nathan points his finger right at King David and says, you are the man. Can you imagine tonight how shocked David must have been when the old prophet stated those words, David, you are the man. In just a moment, anger became guilt. In just a moment, kingly pride was swallowed by utter humility. Can you imagine the worst thing you ever did in your life? The one thing that you were hoping was forever lost to time. The one thing you were hoping you had successfully concealed. If all of a sudden you were confronted with the knowledge that someone knows the terrible thing that you did. I can promise you there are things in my past I don't want any of you to know. And there are things in your past you don't want me to know. But here's David and the preacher, the prophet. We all like to put our face on, our good happy face on for the pastor. But David's pastor knew exactly the sordid details of everything David had done. And there is no doubt that it was a defining moment in the life of David. It was a moment he would never forget. So many emotions, so many thoughts and feelings must have run through his mind in that moment. On the one hand, I'm sure he was overwhelmed by the guilt and the shame. On the other hand, he was shocked at the utter violation and the unsettling feeling that his secret was out in the open. The thing he'd worked so hard to conceal was now known. All of the effort to hide this thing, all of the scheming, all of the planning, all of the sense of false security once the murder of Bathsheba's husband was complete. The flood of relief when he was able to add her to his concubines and finally feel that he had fully concealed the matter. All of that vanished in this instance. All of a sudden he was forced to recognize that he couldn't hide the truth any longer. And tonight I must share with you the truth that David learned that night and that is you can not hide anything from God. <clears throat> no matter how well you conceal a thing, there is always one who knows the truth. He knows all things. He knows the most secret things in your life. You might hide it from everyone else, but you cannot hide it from Him. You might conceal that matter from your spouse. You may hide it from your parents. You might successfully hide a thing and feel as if no one knows and you've gotten away with it. You might think that that thing was securely concealed. You may hope that it is ever forgotten. But mark my words, there is one who knows. There is one who sees. There is one when no one else will ever see you. He knows and he sees. Mama Craft used to say it this way, watching you watching you. There's an all-seeing eye watching you. And you cannot hide anything from Him. He knows the very thoughts and intentions of your heart. Not even the utter darkness can conceal you from His all-seeing eye. He knows everything that there is to know about you. You might have fooled everyone else, but you've not fooled Him. And in that moment, when Nathan revealed the dreadful truth, David's heart was smitten before the Lord. There were two courses that he could have taken. There were two roads that lay before him, both a blessing and a cursing. On the one hand, he could have chosen to make excuses. He could have tried to continue and to cover up. He could have tried to rationalize away his guilt. He could have took his kingly authority and his kingly indignation and said, Nathan, I'm putting you to death. Nathan was the only one that knew, the only one that God had spoken to. I'll put you to death just as I put Uriah to death. Or on the other hand, he could throw himself at the mercy of God. And David, with reckless abandon, chose the latter. He chose the blessing instead of the curse. He chose the mercy and forgiveness of God instead of the wrath of God. And the words of Psalm 51 that we read tonight were born in David's spirit on that night of nights. When the charade of his innocence was torn from him, out of the depths of sorrow, from a heart of repentance, the words to this psalm flowed from David's heart. <clears throat> Have mercy on Upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Up to now, 
David has tried to hide his sin. But now in the face of the revelation that he can no longer hide, he turns to God for mercy. Not only that, but he finally realizes what he didn't grasp at first. Only you, Lord, can blot out my transgressions. I've tried, but I can't escape them. I've tried, but I can't get away from them. I could silence the voice of the preacher in my life, but you'll just raise up another. Everywhere I look, there is conviction. Everywhere I look, I'm continually reminded of this. Only you can block them away. He goes on to say in verses 2 through 3, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. My sin is ever before me. That final statement of verse 3, David is acknowledging the truth that defines his life. My sin is ever before before me. That phrase ever before me conveys several powerful truths that I want to highlight for just a minute tonight. Number one, always before me. All David's sin would always be before him. Even though he gets mercy from God, even though his sins are blotted out by God, David lived under the law of the Old Testament. And the sad but brutal truth is that his sins will always, for the rest of his days, be just before him. His only hope is the sin sacrifice. But the blood of bulls and goats cannot wash away sin. His sins will always just be rolled ahead for just one more year. The looming guilt is there every year. The condemnation will be there every time he carries his sin sacrifice to the temple. Every time he selects a lamb, he will be reminded of the dreadful thing that he has done. He will always, for the rest of his life, bear the crushing guilt of those terrible, tragic choices in his life. They would just be rolled ahead, but only for one year at a time. And every year, David would have to face again the greatest failures of his life. Not only were they always just before him, but they were always growing. David's sin, the unfortunate truth is that not only was it before him, but it was always growing. His guilt was always increasing. Each year in David's life brought new failures, new guilt that was added to the old guilt, new transgressions that compounded the old transgressions. David's sin wasn't just a static reality that was always before him, but it was a dynamic, growing problem that was looming over his life. Each year the guilt was greater and greater. Each year his transgressions were more and more. Each year he fell further and further short of the measure of God's law. He was guilty. He would always be guilty. And his guilt was ever growing. And the best he could hope for was to roll his sins just ahead one more year. To take the ever-growing list of wrongs and faults and failures. The ever-growing evidence that demanded death under the rule of law. The best he could do was to just push his judgment off for one more year. And that's the worst truth that is conveyed by this phrase ever before me. And that is that there is an always awaiting judgment. Ultimately, judgment was waiting. Even if David did everything right, even if David fulfilled the full letter of the law, the best he could hope for was one more year. He may roll his sins ahead, but the truth was always there that he was only putting off the inevitable for another year. Sooner or later, a price had to be paid. Sooner or later, he would have to answer for his sins. Sooner or later, the blood of Uriah would be placed fully and squarely on his hands. And David's was in fact a dreadful reality. That judgment was never satisfied. It was just rolled forward for one more year. David lived under the heavy weight of the reality. That you can put a thing off. And you can put it off, and you can put it off, but you are only 
prolonging the inevitable. Sooner or later, you have to answer for what you have done. Sooner or later, the sin that is ever before him is going to demand accountability. The sacrifice has to be given. The price has to be paid. The account must be settled. David keeps offsetting the penalty temporarily, pushing it ahead one year at a time. But sooner or later, he will have to face what he has done. You and I are blessed tonight because we live under the new covenant, under the the Lamb of God. It is so important on that wonderful day that John the Baptist stood in the River Jordan doing what he had been called to do, making straight the ways of the Lord, preparing for the arrival of the Messiah. He knew God had sent him there to baptize people and to get people ready for one that cometh after him, whose shoes he was not worthy to even latch. He said, he that cometh after me will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And on this day in the Jordan River, John lifted up his eyes. And John 1 and 29, he lifted his voice and said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Thank God for the precious blood that flowed down Calvary's tree. He was the Lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world. He did not just come to roll them forward. He did not come to just temporarily pacify judgment. But He came to take away my sin. And He came to take away my guilt. And He came to remove the ever-present responsibility for sin. The ever-looming judgment for sin. Thank God for the Lamb of God. He bore the brunt of God's wrath at Calvary. He paid the price for my sins. And He did more than just cover them. He did more than just roll them ahead. But He brought forgiveness. He brought remission. He brought a blood covering that would forever cover sin. He made the words and the cry of the psalmist a reality. David did not understand what he was writing when he said, He cast my sins as far as the east is from the west. But in Jesus, this is made reality. David did not know the impact of what it meant when he wrote that our sins would never be remembered again. But Jesus made this promise real. He stood in my place. He stood as not just another lamb, but his blood was more than just the blood of bulls and goats. He bore the wrath. He faced the judgment. Pastor read it this morning. Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgressions. His, the chast- his, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He didn't just push judgment off for another year, but he paid the price for my sins. He died for my iniquities and he established that they would never be remembered against me again. You know what I'm most thankful for on this Thanksgiving is Romans 8 and 1 that says there is now for no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. My heart was grieved recently having a conversation with another church leader friend of mine and he said he'd been reading a book how that we need to communicate better with sinners and I agree and as a church we can do a better job sometimes we talk in cliche and we talk in confusing biblical language that maybe guests don't understand but this person looked at me and said we're even thinking about Not using the phrase the blood of Jesus and being washed in the blood. But there is no gospel, friend, apart from the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so this year at Thanksgiving, you can thank God for your nice car. And you can thank Him for your nice house. And you can thank Him for the feast that's before you. And for health in your body. And all of those things are great. But I thank Him that He came from heaven and took my place and shed his blood that there is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus this includes both the sins and the execution of guilt 
The greatest reason to give thanks is not that he healed my body, although he has many times. It's not that he's provided for my needs, although he has over and over again. It is not the roof over my head and the food on my table, but the greatest reason to give thanks is that I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was bound by sin, but Jesus Christ has set me free. Paul said that where sin did abound, his grace doth much more abound. He paid the price. He bore the judgment for my sins. Both the sentence and the execution of the sentence have been fully satisfied at the cross. And so I'm thankful that the blood of Jesus has done for me what the blood of bulls and goats never did for King David. I'm thankful that my sins are not ever before me. I'm thankful that I'm not left with that fearful looking forward to of the looming of the judgment of God. Nobody today had to bring a sin sacrifice in here and shed blood and kill that sacrifice. But the blood of Jesus has washed away our sins. I'm thankful to know that he's already paid my price, removed both the sentence and the execution of that sentence. The price has been paid. Perhaps you think like David, that perhaps you can escape judgment for your sins. Perhaps you think that you can mitigate the wrong that you've done by doing right. But unfortunately, the letter of the law says otherwise. Several years ago, I received a speeding ticket. And uh, I've got a lot of officer friends. And I thought, you know, really, I was in a hurry. I had somewhere that at the time seemed important to me to be there. And I was speeding. But I'm going to call one of my officer friends. They'll understand my situation. I was in a town I didn't grow up in, had never driven through, took a route I was not familiar with. I was in a hurry to get back. I think it was to pick up Emory from school. And I was speeding. But it was extenuating circumstances. Surely my officer friend will help me. He'll see my case. He'll understand that my intentions were good. And he'll throw my ticket out. He didn't do that. He said, Mr. Saller, well, Brian, I'd like to help you, but they'd fire me if I helped you. I'd get in big trouble because you were wrong. You were speeding. They got you dead to rights. You could go stand before the judge, but all that judge is going to care about is that the officer pulled somebody over named Brian Sadler doing 65 and a 50, and he's going to cause you to pay that fine. It ain't going to matter. You can say you weren't driving. Somebody else was. All they know is Brian Sadler's car was going 65 and a 50. A man that said he was Brian Sadler handed over a driver's license, and they're going to charge you that fine. I told you all of that to say this, that in our court system, the judge is bound to interpret the law by the letter of the law. It matters little if your intentions were good. It matters little if there were exceptional circumstances. Guilt is not determined by the spirit of the law. Guilt is determined by the letter of the law. And the truth is that by the letter of the law, we are all guilty. We have all sinned and all fallen short of the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 3, 6 says, For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The letter of the law kills. The letter of the law is wrapped up in works. It is based on what we can do. But it is based on our our obedience to the law. But for everything that we can do, we cannot forgive ourselves. We cannot remove our own guilt. We will always be guilty under the letter of the law. We will always deserve judgment because the letter kills. But the Spirit represents what only God can do. The Spirit sets us free. The Spirit sees not our guilt, but it sees His innocence. The Spirit sees not our failings, but His supreme sacrifice. The Spirit makes His blood the issue rather than our faults. The Spirit gives life and life more abundantly. The most terrible thing about sin is that it never leaves us. I can't tell you how many folks I've known that were forgiven of their sins, but were never able to forgive themselves. 
It is a spiritually debilitating thing to live where David lived. To live in that place where you never fully get the victory over your past. That place where past faults and past wrongs haunt you and hold you back. That place where you are constantly reminded that you failed God. Can I tell you a secret tonight? That God does not want you to live in that place. You have been forgiven. Your sins are under the blood of Jesus. And heaven will never remember them against you. But now the enemy, the accuser of the brethren, lives only in our past. He makes it his business to bring those things up. He makes it his business to try to make you constantly aware of them. And if you struggle with guilt over past sins, if you struggle with forgiving yourself, it is time for you to get victory in that area. Colossians 2 and 12 says, In you, being dead in your sins, the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you of all, not some, not a few, but all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to my cross? No, nailing it to His cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, He made a show of them, openly triumphing over them in it. At the cross, God, in a single stroke, wiped out the whole record of your offenses. He blotted out the handwriting of the ordinances that were against us. Everything that hell accuses you of, everything that the enemy keeps dragging back up is under the blood of Jesus. God does not even remember it. He has removed it from between you and Him. And here is the wonderful truth. Here is the greatest reason to give thanks. The same nails that nailed Jesus to that cross nailed the whole list of your offenses is there as well and they were covered in the same blood that cleanses your sin and washes away your iniquities someone said that God can't forget but my Bible says that he chooses not to remember don't let the guilt of your past sin lord over your life. Don't let your past dictate your future. What is under the blood is under the blood. If God forgets, then we should strive to forget. R.A. Torrey wrote a book around the turn of the last century, the year 1907. And in it, he shared the story of a particular Sunday in the church that he pastored in Chicago. He said that after service, a man lingered in the sanctuary. When he went to talk with the man, he immediately, the man immediately broke down, began to cry, and said, I'd like to be saved, preacher, but I've committed a sin for which there is no forgiveness. I remember my mother reading in the Bible when I was a boy that those who committed this sin could not be saved. The preacher asked him what the sin was that he had committed. The man proceeded to whisper his wrongdoing in the ear of the preacher. Immediately the preacher turned to his Bible and flipped to 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11. through 11, And reading it to the man, he asked, Is this the passage that your mother read? The verse reads this way, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. With great sorrow, the man said, yes, yes, sir, that's the passage. Then he questioned the preacher, does it not say there is no salvation for those who did these sins? Does it not say they shall not inherit the kingdom of God? The preacher simply, simply responded by saying, Sir, listen while I read to you the next verse. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All of a sudden, that man began to shout, Does it say that? 
Does it really say that? The preacher handed him the Bible, said, read it for yourself. And with tears in his eyes, the man read the passage and ran immediately to the altar and began to repent, rejoicing and repenting over his sins with newfound knowledge that once they are under the blood, they will never be remembered against us again. Tonight, I ponder that we really stop to give God proper thanks for the greatest miracle, the miracle of salvation. The New Testament tells of one of Jesus' many miracles. It said he was walking through a village one day. There were ten lepers there. They cried out to him, Master, cleanse us, heal us of this leprosy. He told him, he said, go, show yourself to the priest. Immediately they got up, they began to run. As they were running, they realized they were cleansed. And the one realizing he was cleansed, ran back to Jesus, fell at Jesus' feet, and began to give thanks. And we focus on that, how great it was, because he began to give thanks, and Jesus told him, because you have recognized the cleansing, you've come back to give thanks, you are made whole. You're not just cleansed of leprosy, but you're made whole of the effects of leprosy. Fingers, toes, piece of your body that you've lost to leprosy are restored. It will be as if you never had leprosy to begin with. But then Jesus stops and he says this, Were there not ten? Where are the nine? When you understand that leprosy was a type and shadow of sin. A sickness that could not be cured. Could not be cleansed. That they had to go when it was put into remission. They had to go and stand before a high priest that declared them clean. Just like with sin, you had to have a high priest. When you realize that this one man realized that he had been in the presence of the ultimate high priest. And he was thankful and came back and expressed that thankfulness. And Jesus touched said, not only are your sin, not only is your leprosy cleansed, but it's as if you never had any leprosy to begin with. But where are the nine? We get excited about financial miracles. We get excited about healing miracles. We get excited about all different kinds of things that God does for us. But when was the last time you really got happy to know that your sins were blotted out. Amen. Things that maybe haunt your mind, God doesn't even remember. That the angels rejoice because your name is written. When was the last time you said, well, I think about the Lord and how He's, it just makes me want to shout. Not because they're singing it, but because when I think of His goodness and all that He's done for me, not His provision, not His healing, but that He came from heaven, robed Himself in flesh, and stood in my place, died a sin that I should have died, and has forgiven me, cleansed me of all my sins. Not because He's taken me to heaven, not because He's going to give me great things, but He's cleansed me of sins. Lord, I want to thank You. God, I don't know where the other nine are tonight, but if no one else comes to an altar, if no one else kneels at their seat or stands with hands lifted and declares how grateful they are for your grace, God, hear this preacher's heart of thanksgiving tonight that the greatest thing to give thanks for is the blood of Jesus that you have saved me from my sins. The problem with the nine wasn't just their leprosy. The problem with their nine was they weren't grateful for what Jesus had did for them. Are you grateful tonight for the greatest reason to give thanks? I don't have to say anything else. It's prayer time. Find you a place to stand and worship, kneel and pray, whatever you want to do. But let's give God a heart of thanks. Let's sing this chorus with Sister Beth. Makes me want to shout. Makes me want to shout. Thanks.